Again, we have been finding out who we are in Christ, who we are, and how we are wonderfully and fearfully made. Amen. Amen. So you take your Bible and go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The point being, as you and I walk with God, he restores us. So the enemy doesn't want you to hang out with God very much. He wants you to get busy. You got your job, you got the things that you're doing. And so we're switching from our heart to our head, from our head to our heart. Now, this is not a bad thing, because how many here is t has trained for your job? I mean, they put you in a training deal. They taught you in schooling how to do what you do, you see. I was schooled as a minister to do what I was, I'm supposed to do. Amen. Can you say amen? So head knowledge is not bad. You know, I know that we can use Scott or David or a whole bunch of you, that you were trained in certain jobs in a head knowledge. Certainly wasn't spiritual knowledge. It was head knowledge. So it's not, you don't throw away your head knowledge. But when it comes to answering the questions of God who is a spirit, head knowledge falls far short than heart knowledge. Can you say amen? Heart knowledge is very simple. It's described in James chapter 3. The wisdom from above is first pure, peaceable, easy to be entreated, easy to be corrected and approached, full of good fruits, full of good things. This comes down from above. Now, folks, you and I are not in the Old Testament anymore. So James was written to Jews. Most of them were still Old Testament thinking. So when it says, let patience have its perfect work, the it there is God. Let patience, God, have his perfect work. Amen. See, but that was removed from the Jewish people and the Jewish mindset because they were unworthy in their hearts. They even changed Yahweh to Adonai because they were afraid to mention the real name of God, one of the real names of God. Isn't that silly? And yet in the New Testament, you and I can come boldly before the throne of grace to obtain what we need in a time of need. God shall supply all of our need, need according to his riches and glory. You might need to get off the pew and do something. <laughs> you might need to sit still and get off your phone. There are other needs besides supplying other things. Can you say amen? You're still with me. You got 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, I'm going to read something and explain. In chapter 5, starting with verse 16, it says, Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Do you hear what it says? Look, I, when I look at you, I can see your physicalness, but as you grow in the Lord, you look to the... The God part inside each believer. Amen. Look past the physical part to the God part. That's what this is saying. We know no man after the flesh. In fact, it's going to say we don't even know Jesus anymore after the flesh. We know him after the spirits. Hello. And so the problem lies... And a lot of people hadn't figured out because of the lack of teaching. Remember, Paul got teaching that James and Peter didn't have. Paul was chosen out of season to bring the fullness of the understanding of the New Testament. He nearly wrote two-thirds of it to show us the hidden truths that are in the New Testament called the hidden mysteries of the kingdom. No, those hidden mysteries of the kingdom are, for example, Christ in us. Old Testament, they didn't have Christ in them. They look forward to Christ coming. We look forward to meeting with Christ. Can you say amen? You see, and another teaching, the rapture. The rapture wasn't in the Old Testament. Things that lean towards that did, but the rapture isn't taught until the New Testament. It's a hidden mystery. In the Old Testament, New Testament truths are hidden. 
But in the New Testament, Old Testament principles are revealed. We can now understand why Joshua had the problems he did, why Moses went, why Abraham was so blessed and it was put on his account for righteousness. Are you still with me? Now, so it says, therefore we, we know no man according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, listen, yet we know him thus no longer. In other words, they're not, not judging Jesus over the limitations of his physical body. We're looking at his spiritual ability to relate to each one of us. We don't look at people at their physical body. Hello. We look at the spiritual potential that each one of you have. Amen. That's why we don't try to put people in boxes or analyze them or moat hunt. Why see the speck that's in your brother's eye when you got a two by four in your own? Let's say four by four at times. Come on now. And you know how spiritual we can get when we're a little irritated. You know. <laughs> Amen. Are you still with me? All right. So, but we know him no longer after the flesh. Therefore, because we don't look to the physical, therefore, because we don't look to the physical, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Everyone say new creation. Now, the word bear literally means a new species a being. We're not like Adam. We, we weren't restored Adams. We're better than Adam. Adam walked with God. We walk in God. I said, Adam walked with God, but you and I have the capability and to be in God and to walk in God. The fact is we don't do it as often as we should, and that's why we fall under the temptations and the lies of the enemy. Listen, you could get so caught up in God, you couldn't even hear the enemy. The voice of a stranger we will not follow. So we know no one after the flesh. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new species of being. He's a new creation. Old thing passed away. In other words, your past, God considers it gone. He says, I'll remember it no more. I'll throw it in the sea of forgetfulness to never bring it up again. So the next time your mind, remind, your mind reminds you of your past or the enemy throws in a suggestion, you remind him of his future. And you're going to be there to see he drops right off into the lake of fire. Hallelujah! You're a new species of being. Now listen. Okay. And he says, all things have passed away. It's talking about in the flesh. Your flesh now, listen, according to scripture, I'm going to take a lot of scripture and just put it all into one. Everything you do out of the energy of our flesh, for the motive, the flesh wants it, you want that other piece of pie, anything that comes out of that energy just doesn't score with God. It's not a bad thing. People can build a hospital. That's a good thing. But they can do it for the satisfaction of putting their name on it. So anything that we do, this is a Cain and Abel thing, out of our flesh just doesn't go anywhere. No flesh can glory in the presence of God. Now that's not a put down, that just corrects us to realize that our flesh serves our spirit, we don't serve our flesh. Come on, say, no, say amen. So if our spirit is saying do this, but your flesh is saying you don't really want to do that, do it anyway because that's maturity. When you don't feel like doing it, but you know God wants it done, what do you do? You do it because God wants it done, because your flesh has passed away. What you want, what your likes are, are passed away. In other words, put them aside. Lay the old man aside. Why? Because it will rise up from time to time, and it will put its ugly face next to your ugly, ugly, uh, your beautiful face. 
See, I'm, I'm kidding. I was kidding there. Almost had a slip. Your flesh rises up and starts giving you all these negative excuses and all that kind of stuff. Again, meeting with God cures most of that. Why, are you, why do you always talk about meeting with God? Because it's a cure. Yes. It cures most of that. Amen. If you don't do that, you're going to really have problems. You really shouldn't have problems. And when you get before God, he's going to say, you know, those little problems that you kept on having, if you would have just taken the time with me, that would have not ever been or be. Hello. But Carrie, I tried that. It seems to work, but it seems like other things get in the way. Well, then, who do you think's doing that? Every kind of situation will play at one time or another for your attention. So suddenly, you want to give some time with God and everything like the phone rings. This happens. That happens. You got to put it all aside and you got to let God know it doesn't matter what happens, He's first. Once you get that down, and believe me, the reason why I've been spending a lot of time in this is because a lot of you are still not doing it. Remember a Baptist preacher? He got voted in to preach. Nothing wrong with Baptists, okay? <laughs> Please don't read it. <laughs> And of course, they invite, they, 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 they vote their pastors in. So they voted this guy in. He was great. And he preached a powerful salvation message. And everybody, you know, people who came up, you know, about six people in the church that came on up, got saved, you know, and everything like that. And, and so the next Sunday, so we couldn't wait to what he's going to preach another powerful salvation message. So the board got together and decided that we're going to talk to him. Says, hey, we hired you to teach us the word of God, not to continually get us saved every Sunday. He says, what's the problem? He says, when you get saved, we'll move on to the next subject. The board wasn't saved. <laughs> You got to watch it. There's two of you. Here's the flesh you could get on the board or the spirit you could be on the board. How, you're, how is your day going, Bunky? Are you in the flesh or the spirit today? You have the key. Amen. And so, again, not picking on you, just letting you know the excuse that I don't have the time to meet with God is the worst excuse you could ever give in your entire life because all God wants to do is make your life better. Amen. And if you won't even give him the time of day to do that, then whose hypocrite are you playing? Now, I'm not trying to pick on us. I'm just telling you, once you start doing that, everything changes. Some of you have gifts that God has purposely given you to produce these gifts. You don't hide them under a bushel. No, you're producing with them. God's raised some of you up for finances. Some of you up for hospitality and different things. Can you say amen? But it isn't until we get to that time with God that he brings out that maturity in us that we can step by faith into those gifts and offices. And that's what God wants for us. Can you say amen? Look at your neighbor says, you are a champion, I can tell. So, you are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things, notice it says, all things become new. Everyone say all things. All things. Now, I want to tell you something. In this case, not all things means everything. Okay, there are certain all things that mean all things that pertain to this and other things, all things that pertain to that. So how will he with Christ freely give us all things? Hello? We have Christ, don't we? So God's willing to give you everything you have need of at any time. Just meet with him. 
And you say, all things. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All things. Well, the key to that scripture is over in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. It says, all that grace and peace is multiplied to you through the knowledge of him and all things that pertain to life and godliness have been given unto you. So God has deposited everything that he is, everything that he has provided in your spirit. It's been deposited in there in seed form. And when we meet with them, that seed germinates. The more we meet with them, the more it grows. And even though it be less than all the other seeds that you can see with your eyes, it will shoot forth great branches. Just keep meeting consistently. Meet consistently. It isn't what we go through that matures us. If that was the case, we'd all be really mature. It's who we know and our exposure to him that matures us. See, this is the deception. Character is built by meeting with God. Okay? Character is not built by existing in the world. What you go through is designed to destroy you in this world. There's not one thing Satan's got set up in this world to bless you. It's all designed to destroy you. So our blessings come from whom? God. How often do you meet from the blesser? You should be meeting with him often. Joshua was told by God, Moses is dead, Joshua. So don't let this book of the law depart out of your eyes or your mouth. You stay meditating in it day and night, for then you will make your way prosperous. And then you will have good success. Why? Because he brings God in, and God is taking the lead in Joshua's leadership. Can you say amen? God took the lead in Abraham's leadership. God took, the Father took the lead in Jesus' leadership. And God wants to take the lead in our life in leadership. Say amen. Okay. All things have become new. Amen. And all things have become new. Now all things are of God. Uh oh Now remember, he's not talking about everything's from God. He's talking about everything that God put in your spirit is from him. Well, how do we know? How, I mean, how do we know what quality God gives? He says every good and every perfect gift comes from our Father of lights, in whom he doesn't change nor alter his, his ability towards us. Amen. So if it's good and it's perfect, get it. Amen. God is good, isn't he? Is God perfect? Yes. Be with him. World good, world perfect. So don't spend as much time in it. If you're going to work in the dump, Change your clothes and take a shower when you get home. You're living in a dump. Beautiful world with all of its beautiful creations and birds and all that. It's beautiful, but the world system is designed to rip us off. It's a one-armed bandit. Let's see what today's going to bring. Da, 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 da. And the enemy right on your, your, your case saying, why don't you go ahead and rip somebody off or go do that. It's okay. God's not looking. Or you know the whole scenario. A couple of points I want to give you. Number one, we are a spirit being. Say I'm a spirit being. I have a soul and I live in a body. Okay, say it again. I'm a spirit being. I have a soul and I live in a body. All right, so let's define some of this with you, okay? We are to operate from our spirit man. Okay, the inner man, the spirit man. Okay, the spirit man is not here. It's not in your head. 
He's in your guts, in your being, bowels of mercy, it says. He's in your spirit. So what happened is when you got born again, God took out satanic nature and Adam's fallen nature and put himself in there, mixed your spirit and God's spirit up, and there is no evil within your spirit. That's why the scripture says if you have the seed in you, you don't constantly sin. Because Jesus checks you. When you're, when you're up ready to do something wrong and you hear a big loud voice saying, don't do that. Now you have a choice to do it or not to do it. Moving right along, are you still with me? All right, so catch this. So we're a spirit being. We relate to God in our spirit. We don't relate to God or talk about God from our soul. Our soul is missing some things. Oh, well, you talk about your own soul, Carrie. <laughs> no, we're all missing a few things here. Can you say amen? All right. So when you're talking about God, we can either talk about our previous experience with God or what we think we know religiously of God. But only our spirit man knows God, and God lives in our spirit man. So let me ask you, from your spirit man, can you sin? No. Because God lives in your, your spirit man. Okay? Heart is more than just spirit man. Heart means soul and spirit. Okay? We'll get to that later. So God lives in your spirit man. Can God sin? Why can't God sin? He'll stop being God. So he can't sin nor he will he sin. That's why when Paul says walk in the spirit, he was saying walk from the realm that God puts you in that does not sin. If we walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill the lustings of the flesh. The flesh lusts against the spirit. Oh, you don't want to go to church today. You got this and got to do this and you got to do this, this, this. Make a decision. Go to church anyway. Best you can, make the decision. Okay. Here's how the enemy works. The enemy works by putting one person against another. By putting things in opposition. You got to be careful how I say things so I'm not perfect. Sometimes I'll say something and it confronts. It sort of it exposes something, you know. Don't get in opposition with the truth. Can you say amen? If God says, hey, you really, really need to be doing this, don't get yourself in making excuses and in opposition to it because you're setting yourself up. Enemy loves for us not to obey God. And you say, well, well, Pastor, it's not always easy to just go out and do it. Of course it isn't. Your flesh doesn't want to. So lay it on the altar and tell it to shut up. Be quiet. Do you ever talk to your flesh that way? I do. Be quiet. Man, it shuts right down. Little lip comes out. Why are you talking to me that way? Are you still with me? Second point I want to give you is this. We are not to regard anyone after the flesh anymore. So don't look at people's faults. Look at their potential and encourage them. Amen? Now, that means you. Don't look at your faults. By looking at your faults, you'll get discouraged. Plenty of people will look at your faults for you. Why look at them? Just bring them to Jesus, can you say amen? Moving right along. And thirdly, we have become reconciled to God, haven't we? You know what that means? We're not an enemy of God anymore. And he's given us a ministry of reconciliation, hasn't he? That means our job is to let everybody know that God loves them. You don't run out and you tell somebody who's lost, you're a sinner and you're going to go to hell. They already know that. Everybody that's going the wrong direction already knows. 
Give them an alternative to change and turn around and become a part of the family of God. Can you say amen? Now, the disciples back during Jesus' time knew certain truths so well, you couldn't pull them away from those truths. In our translation of the scripture, doesn't allow us how they really felt. Well, when Jesus said, if anybody choose to follow me, let him first deny himself, they knew what that meant. They knew exactly what that meant. If they had to, they would go without food, they would go without anything so they could be with Jesus. In the New Testament, in some of us, our luscious, our, our wonderful United States and, and good countries that have pro progressed a little bit, oftentimes it's so easy to lean on what we have. Hey, don't worry, just pop it in the microwave. But when it comes time with God, God has to have you in his presence long enough for him to purge out of you the things that will cause you harm throughout that day. And you got to stay there long enough from God to purge that out of your flesh and to build you up in the spirit. So if you have not made plans to meet with God like that, please do and do not sell out or compromise that time. Because the Bible says your rewards will be open. God will reward you with stability and strength. The most strongest people I've ever seen in my life weren't people that were in the word all the time, were people that were in prayer all the time. Because they got to really know their God. And then when they began to read the word, they knew what the word was saying because they knew their God. Yes. Hello. So let's move on past this, all right? There are three kinds of human beings, okay? All right, we're going to give you the list. Get ready to write this down. Three kinds of human beings. The natural the natural human, the natural man, to the carnal man, and three, the spiritual man. Well, let's look at them. All right, so let's look at the natural man. Go with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, look at verse 14. I'm going to step down here. Why are you doing that, Pastor Kerry? I forgot my water. <laughs> Don't let me turn my back to you, though. All right, you with me? Look at verse 14. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned, or if you have a better translation, revealed. You see, a person that is in the physical realm won't regi register spiritual things. We have a lot of professors that won't believe spiritual things. Hello? We have doctors and lawyers who won't believe these spiritual things. Why? Because they're natural men. And in the natural, spiritual things are blocked out. Notice that God had to send his son Jesus to come in the natural so natural men and women could see what truly God was like. He that had seen me has seen the Father. Are you with me? But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit. They are foolishness to him because he either doesn't know them or because they are spiritually revealed. So going to Bible, excuse me, not Bible, but going to college, you're going to get a lot of natural knowledge. And learning in the world and being exposed to different things, we learn good and bad things, don't we? That's the natural man tells us he can't receive from the Spirit of God. So the natural man is ruled by his five senses. See, we call a natural man ruled by his five senses. Now, you have eyes, ears, taste, touch, 
and smell, five senses. Each one goes to the brain, comes up to a door we call a gate. Okay, so your eye, your eyes don't see, your brain sees what your eyes bring to the gate. And then you have a desire either to accept that or to reject that. Your ears, your mouth, your nose. These are all channels to the gate where either you open up to or you close off to. Amen. If the devil handed you something that's poisonous, you could close off to that. If the devil tells you to jump off of the Smith Tower, you can tell him no in your natural man. You can resist that. You see, even the natural man can resist the devil. He just doesn't know it. Because the devil goes to the reasoning faculties. and convinces people they're not worth anything. Tries to tell you you always be a drug addict. You always this, you always that. That's what the natural man receives. Very disappointing at times, huh? Now we go to the carnal man. Here's a stage even worse. So let's look at what it says about the carnal man. So what the natural man can't see or touch or smell, he can't really open up. Remember Thomas? Except for I touch and thrust my hand into the uh, side, I won't believe. Natural man, okay. Now let's go to the carnal man. Romans 8, please. Everyone say, thank God I'm not carnal. <laughs> now, the word carnal comes from the Greek word carnivorous. When you're carnivorous, you are a what? A meat eater. So to be carnally minded means you're a meathead. You can borrow that, brother. Oh, yeah. Amen. You're a meathead. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> and often act that way. Amen. All right, so let's look at what it says. Romans 8, verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh, your senses, your sense realm, you live according to what you see, touch, taste, and smell. Set their minds or dwell on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, whatever you yield yourself to, you're going to become a product to. Look what it says in 6. For to be carnally minded, a meathead, is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So we can make a choice, can't we? Because the carnal mind is an enmity or division against God. For it is not subject to the laws of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh, what's the next phrase? Cannot please God. Back to Cain and Abel. It wasn't the fact that Cain's vegetables and his garden wasn't wonderful. It's the fact that Cain was going to do it his way. I did it my way. Have you ever asked God, God, how am I doing? And there was a space in heaven for a, a space of a half an hour. How am I doing, God? Is there something in my life you won't want changed? How about me sitting down and really listening to the word? Do you know what the Bible says? The Bible says, he that has an ear to hear, more will be given. But he that does not have the ability to listen, even what he has, the thief will steal away. Jesus ran around. Must have been people without any ears, Sherry. Hey, those with ears, let them hear. For the same measure you meet, 
it will be measured unto you again. And then he says in, in Luke 8 and in Mark 4, be careful what you hear and be careful how you hear it. Two different things. What you listen to and how you listen to it. Because if you're really paying attention, more will be given you. More revelation, more favor, more grace will be given to you. Why? Because you're doing it God's way. You're not interpreting it your way for God. <laughs> All right. So, carnal minded. All right, so it says, point one, when we live for ourselves and are sensual and wanting, this is called carnality. It's called being carnal or selfish minded. Selfish minded people hurt others. Two, there are two of us. One we feed the most is the one who's in charge at the time. You ever seen somebody, maybe at a concert, and they're pushing and shoving, trying to get in line? Here's a sample. You know, we're not talking Christians here. So you have an old man who wants to get up and do his thing just like he used to. We know that man no longer after the flesh. Can you say amen? Don't let people bring up your past. If you do, change the subject right away. You notice God never brings up yours. Hey, by the way, Brian, I have a few things to talk to you about. <laughs> You're on the tape, so brother, you got to listen to it again. <laughs> Bless your heart. All right. So you got the idea of carnal, just plain meathead. Okay. Are you with me? All right. One more point is those who are in the flesh... They're controlled by their sensual desires. I mean, Pastor Kerry, now listen to me careful. If somebody truly is born again, can they still be carnal? What's the answer? I, I'm afraid, yes, because some churches, you can't tell the difference between the people in the church and the world. Because they haven't learned that the, the carnal part of them is to be crucified on a daily basis. That selfish, I'm the best, I'm the greatest, I'll do what I want. The creator of all the problems the partner Satan needs is our flesh. Must be crucified on a daily basis. Take up your cross and follow me, Jesus said. That means take up your death, dying to yourself, and follow me from your spirit. I'll show you things to come. I will reveal to you what the future holds. I will bless you beyond wildest dreams. Okay, now the third person we need to talk about is the spiritual man. Everyone say, that's you. Okay, a spiritual man is somebody that's ruled by their human spirit with God's help. Can you say amen? All right, so the spirit man does not rely on his thinking. The spirit man relies on the word and the understanding God gives them for the day. That means you got to meet with God first thing in the day to get your marching instructions. There, there might be nothing else than enjoy yourself, son. I'm with you. Have you ever heard God say play? I have. Take the day off, son, and play. What? God, you want me to really enjoy myself with you? <laughs> Yes! That's the whole thing. Get with God and enjoy yourself with Him. Are you with me? All right. Now, you know I'm not picking on you, right? Look at Galatians chapter 6. 
1 through 4 talks about the spiritual man, okay? Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a trespass or a fault, you which are spiritual, tell that person what they're doing wrong. Is that what it says there? I want to see if you run your Bible. See. No. It says restore him. You see, a spiritual person is not into people's suffering. A spiritual person doesn't want others to do it wrong. A spiritual person walks in love and does it the right way because the influences of God are moving him that way. So you which are spiritual restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. In other words, don't get on their case. Don't chew them out. Don't say you're a knucklehead. You're a meathead for doing that. Just some, you're a child of God. And the fact that you did that, did you hear a voice telling you to do that? Yes, you did. That little voice in you tell you can't sit still in that chair? Same little voice that irritates you, makes you can't sit still? Those are things from without. They're not things with, from within that God lives. Listen, once you're saved and God comes to live in you, he doesn't jump out of you every time you blow it. Oh, there goes God. He's not a jack-in-the-box. Huh? Every time you do something wrong, he jumps out of you. Then you got to get re-saved and saved again. No. When you do something wrong, the Bible says you grieve the spirit and you quench him. So he'll wait patiently till you're done with your little thing. And they'll say, I've heard him many times say, are you done, Carrie? Are you done? No, I'm not done right now. I still have a couple of complaints. Are you done? So notice something. This is for somebody here today. When you make a mistake, God doesn't leave you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. But you think he does because the lies come through your mind. So when you grieve God, you still haven't been delivered. If you really, really say this is the lie, then you wouldn't have that problem. Hey, you're wrestling with your flesh. You're going to have problems every time you listen to your flesh. Your flesh is a big, blowhard, complaining thing. It's an entity that cannot subject itself to God. So it must be crucified on a daily basis so that it doesn't get in your way and you enjoying the presence of God and letting God bless you. Can you say amen? amen. And so you got to learn with God's help to put things in checks and balances. Can you say amen? How many has ever had, don't raise your hand on this, had concerns and worries? Yet the Bible says, be anxious for nothing. It tells us how to cure worries and concerns. Can you say amen? So we're doers of the word and not just hearers only. Let's move on. All right, so we're the spiritual person. We restore. So listen to what it says. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something... He's a meathead. No, to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Hello? I am better than you are. I am better than you. Uh uh. I'm just a pastor. I have an office that I'm in. But I'm not any better than you. And you're not any better than me. Not, not only that, but we're not in competition. We have a race to run, but the race is a relay race. You got to pick up the things that God wants you to pick up in your life. And when you've picked up the last one, your life is over. Okay? So maybe that's why a lot of you don't come to church. You don't want to pick up too many things and you don't want your life over too quickly. I'm just joking with you. No, God, you get up in the morning, you meet with them. God says, this is what I want you to do today. You do that, bing, suddenly it opens doors. More benefits and blessings come your way, and you go, wow, how did that happen? You picked up the little baton that God wanted you to do today. Maybe there's two. And God says, Peggy, I want you to do this, and I want you to send that birthday card over to that person. Bing, bing, 
thinking, suddenly the, the door opened. You're running a race in competition with your flesh, which says, I don't want to do nothing. But, but make myself important and sit here and become fat. No. <laughs> Hey, boy, I said, now please, if you feel like you're overweight, I'm not picking on you. It's not, it has nothing to do with that. That has to do with, hey, you want to get lose weight? Don't feed your flesh all that much. Soak it. Drink more water. <laughs> anyway, I, I'm fooling with you just a little bit. But how many know that some people can get really down? I mean, something happens and they're down and they feel sad and all. No, don't let them sit in that. You which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Let each one examine. I love this one. This is one thing Christians don't do very much. Let each one examine his own work. And then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in others. Sit down with God and say, God, how am I doing? It says before we take communion, analyze yourself. We're, we're going to have communion next week, by the way. But when we sit down for communion, we're supposed to take the time to analyze ourselves so that we're not taking it unworthily or disrespectfully. Are you with me? Say, with your walk. Why wait till the end of the week to ask God how you did? I don't know about you, but I work for many a company that give you evaluations and incentives if you do a good job. Are you saying God evaluates us and gives us incentives? Absolutely. He rewards the faithful. Hello? And it says if you seek him diligently, he rewards you openly. So the one who walks in with the most blessings is, you know, the one that prayed a lot that week. Hello, I'm going to stop and pause right there. Because the key is your time with God. It's always been, always will be your time with God. Amen. Little time with God, there's going to be a lot of you hanging around. Now, I'm not talking all at one time, but when you meet with God faithfully, consistently, God grows you out of yourself speedily. You want to know why certain people go quickly and have good ministries? Time with God. Are you with me? The hidden man of the heart. So let's look at this for a minute. The hidden man of the heart. So you and I should examine ourselves. I like to do it at the end of the day. See, the first of the day, I present myself, ask God to crucify my flesh, have him charge me up, have him zap me, do whatever is needed to be. It takes about 20 minutes. Or if, 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 if you want to take more time, you can. I don't really time it. I just sit down and I talk. I pray for our nation, Israel. I pray for you guys. I pray for our family. I pray for our, all kinds of things that God directs me. And as I do, I stop and I just tell him how much I love him and soak up his presence. You just open up and soak up his presence. Don't wait for a goosebump. Just soak up his presence. Imagine yourself as a dry sponge being dropped into a bathtub of water. You're soaking his presence up. Lord, I love you. Appreciate you, Lord. Soak me in your presence. Lord, if there's something in my heart that pushes you away, soften my presence. And you just lavish into God. Does that help you? Lavish into your shepherd. The sheep, when they see their shepherd, me, food, 
fresh water, me, yeah. See, our good shepherd, he's talking about not me, but a good shepherd. Are you with me? So let's look at the hidden man of the heart. First Peter chapter 2. Oh, excuse me, 1 Peter chapter 3, 3 through 4. Now, this is a touchy subject here. Remember, we know no man after the flesh. So here Peter is going after the right adornment. Everyone say adornment. Okay, and he's going to relate to people dressing up and looking pretty, looking handsome. Nothing wrong with that. Everyone say amen. Now, let me ask you, how about the Pharisees in uh, Matthew 23? Didn't they dress up really nice? Didn't they look like whited sepulchers? Didn't they present themselves as on the street corner saying, I give, I fast twice a day, you see? But how many know it's not the adorning of the outward person that in precious the inside of God? So this is what it says. So if you've gone out, bought a few extra dresses, you've gotten some new makeup, this is not referring to you, okay? This is just the balance of pointing out the hidden man of the heart. Everyone say that with me. Hidden man of the heart. So there's a part of you that's hidden in your heart. So let's find out what it says. Do not let your adornment be merely outwardly. Arranging of the hair, the wearing of gold, the putting on of fine apparel. God's not against any of that. Okay? But he'd rather have you pretty up the inside. Can you say amen? Okay, and he says... Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart, see it, which in, is incorruptible beauty of, of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. He's talking about adorning your inner man. How would we go about dressing our inner man? If we could put makeup on our outer man, that's different. And we could dress in nice clothing with our outer man, that's different. How do we go about dressing our inner man? In prayer. Amen. Going to God and say, thank you, Lord. And God addresses your inner man. He beautifies it. He makes it shine. You are the light, a city set on a hill. Hello. So he adorns you. Now, sure, you got pretty makeup and you got pretty suits and things like that. That's fine. And you know, here at this church, we don't have a dress code. Just please wear something. <laughs> yeah! Amen. Amen. All right. But nevertheless, it's the adorning on the inside. We call that a countenance. Everyone say countenance. The light shining out of me. That's what it is. The countenance of God is the light shining out of you. Now, if all you're doing is prettying out the outward man, it's going to shut down the beauty of the inner man. So rather than just prettying yourself out on the outside, make sure you charge yourself up on the inside and you lay your flesh aside on the altar. Can you say amen? Because the most attractive man and the most attractive woman that ever could be is a spiritual man or a spiritual woman. Hello. I've dated some pretty fancy looking ladies. But they had a personality that wasn't any better than cardboard. Not picking on you ladies. You know, I have some that are watching in the film. Seriously, and guys. You know, guys, they're all into themselves. They haven't got time for you. And yet you're on a date. So we do address our outer person, but the most beautiful person that we really are is who we are in Christ when Christ 
beautifies our insides. So we meet with them on a regular basis. Can you say amen? Some of you that are really blessed, you love to go in and have your nails done. And you're, you're t I, get a, I get a two toe discount on, on my pedigree. <laughs> what do they call this when you do toes? Pedicure. <laughs> Yeah, pedigree, I said pedigree, that's who I am, I'm Scottish, but anyway. So I get the two-toed slot deal, you know what I mean? Uh, no, anyway, we have the ability to go in and have our feet done, our hands done, go in and try on a suit, do all these things. Those are wonderful things, they're not bad. God doesn't care. But if that's all you do is prepare the outer man or try to put on yourself as being something you're not, then you're missing the beautiful adornment that God only can bring. Say amen, somebody. So here's what happens. If we don't meet on a regular basis, it's very easy for us to switch from what we know in our heart to what we know in our head. Hello. And oftentimes we go through the day and we're analyzing the day we're going through instead of from the Word of God or from the presence of God, we're analyzing it from our past, what we experience, and we go to apply our past in our present and it doesn't work. What you did two years ago in your walk with God that worked is not necessarily going to work for you to today. You get fresh manna, fresh instructions. Hello? Well, I know certain truths work, like if I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth. Yeah, but you haven't confessed Jesus hardly at all the rest of your life. The Bible says, you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. What happens if you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth throughout every day? You'll really, really enjoy the fullness of salvation. Because God reveals salvation to those that confess him. If you confess me before the Father or before men, I will confess you before the Father. If you deny me before men, I will deny you before the Father and the angels. So we confess the Lord. Can you say amen? And he brings the beauty of our salvation to the forefront and to the surface. All right. So it's a hidden man of the heart. So who is the hidden man of the heart? What part of you? Your spirit man. What then would be the outer man of the heart? Your soul. Remember your soul is your mind, your will, your personality, your intellect. Hello? And what causes you to do, to do what you do? People paint because they like to have paint. People write, they like to write. When I was so sick, I wrote a lot. A lot of things about God. And I kept my mind focused on him. You know, some people like to call it rambling. I call it writing. <laughs> Are you with me? And let's go ahead and bring it to an ending, okay? Head knowledge versus heart knowledge. So let's look at this. Romans chapter 8 again. We're going to look at verses 5 through 9. So our adornment should be on the inside and should be adorned by God. Jesus said the religious people, they look whited on the outside, but they're full of dead man's bones. You go to Romans 8, okay? They look good outwardly, but they're full of death. When we hear the word and understand it, there's an inward chamber that responds, and there's an outward chamber that analyzes. How many know that sometimes we, our analyzer can really get a little bit tainted trying to analyze things? We'll get to that in a minute. So you got Romans 8, look at verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh, the sense realm, set their minds on things of the flesh. 
But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So to let your mind just reason and try to understand things is going to bring you about and separate you from God. But allowing your spirit to analyze and allow God to point it out to your spirit, you'll be full of life and full of what? Peace. What normally would upset you, you're at peace about it because you know God's in charge. Hello. But you can hear the old enemy say, oh, you better worry. You better worry. You've forgotten that God lives on the inside of you and he's not worried about anything. Hello, are you with me? <clears throat> so our spirit with God in it should influence every part of our soul. We should have a godly personality, a godly will, a godly drive, a godly intellect. Can you say amen? Because the spirit of God is influencing our thinking. So... If you're under the control of the Holy Spirit, your thoughts will be sweet, good, pure, perfect, just, be any good report, be any praise report. Think on these things. Amen. So finally, <coughs> those that live according to the flesh shall die. But you are not. Look what verse 9 says. Romans 8, verse 9, just verse 9. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. How many are born again? Then God considers you being in the Spirit. He considers you operating from your heart, not your head. He considers you obeying Him, not even disobeying Him. In fact, God, when asked by the devil said, God said to, to Satan, have you looked at my servant Job? There's none like him in all the earth. Now we know Job married a woman that did not respect God, did not train her kids right, because she said to Job, curse God and die, buddy, and get out of the way. Wow. Yet Job knew enough about God to realize that he was not going to be moved. Can you say amen? Doesn't matter outwardly what happens. It matters you meeting with God consistency and hearing the instruction that he gives you. Hello. Amen. Let's move right on past this. So, you're in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of God, he's none of his. You must have the Spirit of God. A couple of points. Number one, who lives in us? Don't ever forget it. Where does he dwell? What part of us? In our spirit man. Not our head, not our flesh. Are you with me? So God's wisdom comes from the new creature in man, in our spirit, and it opens up into the eyes of our understanding. But if we lean on our understanding and don't consult God, we're going to miss it. Because our mind is also open to the suggestions of what the enemy throws at it. Can't read your mind. Satan can't read your mind. But he'll throw a suggestion and see how you respond to it. Or react to it. Are you with me? Okay, two. Having God living in us, we walk with God while we, he reveals his word to us. This is how we see things. Through his eyes and not our carnal thinking. Amen. We know no man after the flesh. Carnal, carnal mindedness blinds us from the full picture of God who wants to bring that picture to us. He wants to show you what your day is all about, but if we are thinking of ourselves, you won't see it. You'll see complications. You'll see problems. I got to get up and do the dishes today. Well, you know, you can sit back down and hold on to your salvation. <laughs> All right. 
we must rely on God's wisdom. And it's from above. And if you're born again, it's in your spirit. Say, I have wisdom from God because I'm connected to God in my spirit. So you don't pull the wisdom here. You pull the wisdom out of spending time with God. And he'll tell you what to do. Are you with me? Last scripture. Proverbs 3, 5 through and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not to your own. There you go. Trying to understand why you are the way you are. Stop it. Just keep yourself to God. Give yourself to God daily. Amen. And then six, in all your ways acknowledge him. And he shall direct your paths. Folks, to acknowledge God means to interchange in conversation. I talk with God throughout the entire day. God, look at that. That doesn't look good. You know? And God and I talk. We get into engaging in conversation. My wife and I are friends. We converse. We talk. Hello, I don't tell my wife, I'm going fishing, dear, and not return for two weeks. I wouldn't have a marriage, would I? But Christians will pray, get everything right, things will start going right, and then they'll slip back into their old ways. It's like telling the wife, I'm going fishing and not showing back up for four or five days. Hello. We need to be married to Christ, wake up with him, go to sleep with him, fellowship with him. When you're sitting down to eat, invite him to eat with you. Well, Lord, I didn't set you out of place. He's eating with you. Invite him to acknowledge that he's there is the key to having peace. If you don't acknowledge him being there in you and with you, then your mind will wander. But to acknowledge God throughout your day is really allowing God to be in a position of ordering your steps. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. All your ways acknowledge God. Interact with him. And he'll be able to guide your steps. If you got something out of that this morning, will you give the Lord a hand clap?